Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia podcast here on my YouTube channel. Of course, I am your host, John Campia. Starting off this weekend on a Saturday, I hope you guys have a wonderful, fun, fun-filled, exciting, relaxing time this weekend watching football, going to some movies, watching some TV, whatever it is you like to do. Today on the John Campia podcast, we're going to be going over a bunch of movie topics and questions that you guys have sent in to me. Now, how do you get a topic or a question on the John Campia podcast? It's simple. Simply email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. That's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Please make sure to keep your questions and emails to 90 words or less, or I simply else, I can't just fit it on the screen if it's any longer than that. So try to do that. All right, guys, with that out of the way, let's not waste any time. Let's get into the first question of the day. And the first one has to do with the topic, Wonder Woman 2, that we've been talking about a lot lately. And this question comes to us from Captain N. Mann, who writes, Hey, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Captain. I was thinking whether Warner Brothers slash DC should move the release date for Wonder Woman 2 to January. I mean, why not try to release a big blockbuster in January, a dumping month? That way, there wouldn't be any competition and Wonder Woman 2 can own the box office for weeks Thanks for taking my question. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question, Captain. And, you know, for those of you who haven't really been like tuning in for the last week or so, big shift, a big thing happened to Wonder Woman 2. So as you know, a little while ago, Warner Brothers announced that Wonder Woman 2 would release in December of 2019. It looked like it was going to have a pretty safe harbor there. However, recently this week, Disney announced that Star Wars Episode Nine was being moved from May 2019 to December of 2019, just one week after the release of Wonder Woman. Now, one of the things I've been saying for a while here on the channel, I won't go into all the details, but it's basically Wonder Woman's got to move. They have to move. They don't want a movie like Star Wars Episode Nine opening one week later. They saw what happened to Spider-Man Homecoming this year. Spider-Man Homecoming had a huge drop off in week two because it opened one week before War for the Planet of the Apes. They don't want a big major blockbuster, especially the biggest major blockbuster of that year, opening up just one week after it. So then the question amongst fans has been, well, then where should it move? Should it try to jump to May of 2019, where Star Wars was? It's difficult to move a movie that much earlier. So we're talking May, June, July, August, September, October, November. We're talking seven months. I don't know that they, the way they have things scheduled out right now, I don't think Warner Brothers would have Wonder Woman 2 ready for May of 2019. So I think that's kind of off the books. Who knows? Anything's possible. It could happen. Absolutely, that could happen. I just have my doubts about it. But January, moving it, say, I don't know, two months, a month, move it one month, move it to like Star Wars Episode Nine's third or fourth week of release into January. That night might not be a bad idea. So here's some of the reasons why I think it would be a good idea. Here's some of the reasons why I think it may not be a good idea. Okay. Number one, good idea. There is nothing scheduled for January of 2020 right now. I mean, seriously, if you look at most of the release schedules and you look at January of 2020, there's nothing there. So there's been nothing significant announced to be releasing in that month. Number two, January is usually a dumping ground, one of the a couple of dumping grounds during the years where movies put films they don't expect that much business out of. So even once January of 2020 starts to get populated with some movies, there are likely to be low profile movies that would not threaten Wonder Woman. And because Wonder Woman would be the only fish in the pond there, I think Wonder Woman 2 would make a killing, an absolute killing. Yes, there's still going to be people trickling to the theater to see Star Wars Episode Nine in its third or fourth week. Yes, but by that point, most people who are going to have seen Star Wars Episode Nine would have seen it. Is it still a little bit of competition? Yes, but nowhere near as significant as being within one week. So you move Wonder Woman 2 into January, you got this huge month all to yourself, no competition, you're not really worried about the third and fourth repeat business for Star Wars Episode 9, and you got the month all to yourself. To me, and it's not that far from your current release date. Move it one month. Move it one month. Maybe five weeks. Move it five weeks. So therefore, it really doesn't disrupt whatever plans you already have in place and whatever schedules you already have in place 
for a Wonder Woman 2 release date. It seems like a really good idea. Now, here's why maybe a couple reasons why they wouldn't want to do it though. Number one, January has been a dumping ground for a reason. People are just getting off Christmas. They've spent all their money on Christmas presents for the kids and for those family members they don't even like, but they're family, so you got to buy them something. You know, so there are people who are a little bit stuck on cash in January. So that might be one thing Warner Brothers might want to take in consideration. But the big thing is this. The big thing that might stop Warner Brothers from moving a Wonder Woman 2 into January of 2020 is Warner Brothers' own schedule. Take a look at this. While I mentioned that nothing significant is opening in January, there's already a few things scheduled for open that. For instance, on February 7th, okay, Warner Brothers has what they're calling an event film. They, they haven't re- announced what it is yet, but they've booked that date for a big event film. So just shortly after that, but more notably, go down to Valentine's Day, February 14th. Warner Brothers has already scheduled a big DC film for February, just one month after January. To complicate it even more, jump down now to April 3rd. You see the third highlighted thing there. Another DC film is scheduled for April of 2014. All right. So the question then becomes, does Warner Brothers or would Warner Brothers want to have four major Warner Brothers pictures releasing in just the first four months? More specifically then, let's talk about just about DC. Do they want four D or three DC films opening in a four-month window? January, February, March, April, three films crammed into that four-month window? That might be a little bit too much, especially since, you know, aside from a Joker film that they've been talking about, everything's in the same cinematic universe. It might be a little bit too cramped together. Who knows? It might be an interesting experiment too putting out a bunch of films all in a real close period of time. Maybe that would be an interesting experiment, but I have a feeling that right now it's not something that Warner Brothers would want to do. If I were in charge of Warner Brothers, man, I don't know. First of all, the place would go bankrupt. Secondly, I don't know. I think I might try it. I think I might try it. And just kind of see what happens. But it might be, uh, you know, maybe that's the wrong decision. I, I don't know. I'm torn. What would you guys do? You guys are now in charge of Warner Brothers releasing. Do you put Wonder Woman in January, understanding all the advantages, but also standing the disadvantages that could hurt the overall DCU, could hurt those other DCU movies? Or maybe you think it would help the other DCU movies. I want to know what you guys have to think about this, because honestly, I am completely torn. I'm not quite sure what to make of that or what to do about that. Jump in the comment section below. Leave me your thoughts. All right, let's move on to the next question of the day. And the next question today comes to us from James Walsh. And James Walsh writes, Hello, John, and thank you for taking my question. You're welcome, James. What do you think about Disney releasing three live-action remakes in 2019? Dumbo in March, Aladdin in May, and Lion King in July. Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And this is actually quite similar to the situation we were just talking about with Wonder Woman. You know, Warner Brothers right now, without moving Wonder Woman, has four or three big major films opening, an unannounced big Warner Brothers film and two DC films in the first four months. So now here we are. We've got a situation where Disney is releasing three significant films in the span of what, March, April, May, June, July, August. Okay, within a, a cluster of months. Okay, within the same year, certainly within the same cluster of months. I think, though, there is a significant difference between the Disney situation and the Warner Brothers situation. With the Warner Brothers situation, as I mentioned, I think the problem is that these DC films, unless it's the Joker film that they've been talking about, all exist in the same DC cinematic universe. For all intents and purposes, these three Disney films we're talking about, Dumbo, Lion King, and Aladdin, they're all completely unique, separate identity movies. They have nothing to do with each other. Other than the fact that they all have backgrounds in being original Disney animated films, other than that, there is nothing connected to them. There is not a Dumbo Aladdin shared universe. There is not a, um, you know, Beauty and the Beast that came out this year shared universe going on with Lion King. All right. It's just, it's, they're just three completely separate movies. So really the question is, what do we think about Disney releasing three movies? 
just three movies in that five, six month window, whatever amount of window that is. And honestly, I don't really see a problem with it. They're far apart from each other that they're not stepping on people's toes, but they're close enough to each other that I think you can capture some momentum. So actually, let me bring up the question because I forget which was the first one there. The first one is, uh, yeah, Dumbo in March. So let's say Dumbo comes out and people really love it. Well, great. Then in just a couple more months, you can go back to see another Disney live action um, retooled film in Aladdin. And if you like that, then it's just a couple or more months till you get Lion King. So there is some potential upside. I don't really see a lot of downside with it. So it all really depends. Now, you got to ask me the question again once Dumbo comes out. I've got my doubts about Dumbo, um, mainly because I'm not a big fan. I know I'm in the minority. I'm not a big fan of the work of Tim Burton. He's got some films that I that I quite enjoy. He does. I'm not saying I hate all Tim Burton films. I don't. There are a couple of them I actually quite enjoy. But for the most part, I'm not a big fan of his style or of his sensibilities. So plus that and Dumbo is simply not one of my favorite Disney films in the first place. But, you know, if Dumbo comes out and we love it, then having these three films relatively close together becomes a brilliant move. If Dumbo comes out and it tanks and it's not very good, well, then it could hurt the other ones too. But we're just going to have to wait and see and get a little bit closer. And like I said, let's actually lay our eyes on the first one, the Dumbo film, before we really start to form an opinion about whether it was smart or not smart to kind of put three of these films relatively close together. At this point, I don't really see a problem with it. I, I think it's okay. But then again, my answer may change once we actually see Dumbo, if it tanks and causes some damage to the overall brand. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, man. Let's move on to the next one. I've had a few people write me about this, but we're going to take the question from Simone Michelli, who writes, Hello, John. Well, hello. My question regards the film It. How does the production get around the fact that they produced an R-rated film, even though it stars a group of teenagers, young teenagers too, by the way? Also, are the children legally allowed to attend the premiere, even if they don't have the age required? Thanks for taking my question and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Simone. And yes, so the rating system suggests, look, let's not pretend that it is the first movie to have kids in an R-rated film. I mean, we've seen lots of R-rated films where little kids are spouting off F-bombs and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's not really a big deal. It is not the first R-rated film to have children and teenagers in it. It's quite a regular occurrence. It's not that big of a deal. But let's get to the real heart of the question. Like, would these kids even legally be allowed to attend the premiere because it's an R-rated film? Well, the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Here's the basic thing about this rating system you see here, okay? This is the main thing you have to keep in mind. I mean, so uh, G means, uh, hey, anybody should go. PG, parents should be a little aware about what their kids are seeing. PG-13, hey, we recommend maybe you see it with your kids. R means, hey, your kids can see it, but you have to come with them. And then you get into NC-17, which is like, push, it's porn, right? So no NC-17. All right. But here's the big thing about the rating system. It is not put out by the government. The government did not make this rating system, all right? This rating system you see here was made by the movie studios themselves, the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, which is prime, which is made up of the studios, right? They made up this rating system. It is a completely, this is important to understand, it is a completely voluntary movie system. Voluntary. The MPA makes it up as a guideline. They work with the theaters. Yeah, the theaters agree in principle to adhere to the guideline. But the movie theaters are not required to stick to it either. I mean, they do in a spirit of co cooperation. But even that, I mean, I was at uh, AMC theaters when, you know, there was a movie, a, a horror movie coming out that the MPAA slapped with an R, with an NC-17. And the movie theater said, no, we're taking that rating off. We're just going to call it unrated. We're just going to call it unrated and play it. Now, that's against normal policy for the MPAA and their relationship with the movie theaters, but it is not unheard of. The movie theaters are free anytime. Like, if you're six years old, okay, you're six years old and you wanted to go see it, 
you can walk up to the counter and say, I want to see it. And, and if the theater wants to sell you the ticket, they can. Now, generally speaking, they won't because they want to, you know, prove movie theaters want to prove that they are a socially conscious, uh, business that they want to make sure that, you know, R-rated films, a six-year-old kid can still go if they go with their parent. They want to make sure that they're not facilitating kids doing things their parents wouldn't want them to do because that's not their place and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is they're not required to. And from time to time, we see movie theaters just ignore the rating system if they wish. Nobody is required. They are not legally binding. The MPAA guidelines are about as legally binding as me on the show making a decree. Henceforth, no woman shall be allowed to wear blue lipstick. It's just what we need. More men trying to tell women how to live their lives. No women shall be allowed to wear blue lipstick. Blue lipstick is an abomination against nature and humanity. The only time a woman is allowed to have blue lips is if she's getting choked out in an MMA fight. I mean, so so I can decree that. I mean, sure, I can stand here. John says no women allowed to wear blue makeup or blue lipstick. Okay, great. I said it. And now, if, if there's a couple of women out there watching the show who decide, okay, I yeah, I like that rule. So I'm going to uh, adhere to that rule myself. That's their choice. But it has no weight. Me declaring it does not make it law. <laughs> the MPAA saying, we have this rating system. Well, good for you. And, you know, it's actually not a bad rating system. It has its flaws. There's definitely some things that need to be reworked, but it's a voluntary system that theaters can either choose to follow or ignore, and they can mix and match whenever they want. So I can say it all I want. No blue lipstick for you, ma'am. It's not enforceable. Nobody has to follow it. There's no rule. There's no law against patches because I declared it. And that's essentially what's gone on with the MPA. So, how do they get away with having teenagers? Because they're totally allowed. Can the teenagers go to the premiere? Yes, because the MPA ratings are not enforceable. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of it. I hope that, uh, you know, sheds the cloak of secrecy about the MPA ratings a little bit. I hope, anyway, I hope you found that information useful. Maybe it was a little bit useful. I hope it was. All right, now we move on to our next topic. And this, I'll take the opportunity to do my uh, daily shameless plug of my Patreon. This next question comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters. You know, my Patreon supporters get our exclusive Facebook group. They get direct access through our uh, Patreon community to communicate with me. We also do the audio only versions of the John Campia podcast and Star Wars Talk Tuesdays that are exclusively for our Patreon supporters. Patreon supporters is how we make this channel possible because I make 70 to 100 videos a month. This is my full-time gig now, and my Patreon supporters are the one who makes this possible. So maybe you want to consider becoming one of my Patreon supporters. If you're one of the people who enjoys watching my programming, by all means, that would be awesome. Just check out that URL, patreon.com slash John Campion. Check it out. If you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, that's totally fine too. I'm just glad you're here watching the videos. All right, with the shameless plug section out of the way, let's move on to that question from that Patreon supporter. And that question comes us from Patreon supporter, Lori Scott. And Lori Scott writes, I'm a huge Wentworth Miller fan. Who isn't? Come on. And I like your opinion. And I'd like your opinion since I know you're also a fan of The Flash. Do you think he will ever return to the Arrowverse? I think The Flash in particular is poorer for his absence. Yeah, I mean, one of the really cool things about The Flash, actually, I thought one of the cooler things about The Flash was Wentworth Miller's Captain Cold or Snark or Snart. I mean, I keep even want to say Snark, uh, Snart. Um, at first, I thought his character, always oh, talking like this, was a little bit like it was over the top and a little bit annoying. But the more he appeared in the show, I really started to dig it. And you could tell that Wentworth Miller was more and more embracing that character. And it became got to the point that a lot of my favorite episodes are the ones that uh, he was in. But the ones that Wentworth Miller were in playing Captain Cold, he was great. Anyway, they then decided to make a curious decision to move that character off the Flash and make him one of the key characters in Legends of Tomorrow. Then, of course, they killed him off of Legends of Tomorrow. Then they kind of brought him back. So, look, we've seen him come back. He did have that little revival of uh, Prison Break. It did season five. It doesn't look like they're going to do a season six of Prison Break. Now, while Wentworth Miller has a couple of things listed as upcoming projects, nothing's like super major, and I'm sure you could work around them. Look, this is the comic book world. 
any character who is dead for whatever reason can be brought back. They found excuses to bring him back for a number of episodes last year on Legends of Tomorrow. And I believe it was one episode of The Flash as well. I thought they had him on there. Anyway, they can very easily bring him out. There's many mechanisms built in that they can bring him back. I personally would love to have him back because I agree with you, Lori. I think he adds to the show. I think when he's there, the dynamic he represents and the chemistry between him and, you know, Barry Allen, I think is really sharp and really good. I like what he, I like what the Captain Cold character brings out of Barry Allen. I like the influence the Barry Allen character has had on Snart. I think it's just a really great on camera dynamic. And I think it works really well. So if Wentworth Miller wants to come back, I really think the producers of that whole universe should figure out a way to bring him back and don't kill him off again. He's just simply too valuable. Now, I'm sure leaving was probably Wentworth Miller's decision because he had, you know, prison break and he had a couple other things going on. But I mean, if he's willing to come back, make room for him, have him come back. He's too good of a character. I miss him on the show. I know a lot of you guys do too. And I think he would be a valuable addition. And yeah, I think it hurt. I think you, as much as I enjoyed Flash season three, I feel like you could feel his absence. You could feel Wentworth Miller's absence. It would be nice to have him in there. He doesn't have to be in every episode, but put him in four or five episodes a season. I just think it makes the seasons all the better. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, Laurie. We move on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from John McAfee. And John McAfee writes, if Han Solo does not make a billion dollars, how will, you know what? I did this the wrong way, but I'll do it. I'll take this question now anyway. If Ron Howard, if Han Solo does not make a billion dollars, how will Ron Howard's legacy be viewed as? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. Um, yeah, Han Solo is coming out. We all know there was a whole bunch of drama. Lord Miller, who everybody was excited about at first, me included, very excited that they were coming on to Han Solo. From all the stuff I'm hearing and a lot of stuff that you've read and heard too, you know, Lucasfilm, uh, Kasdan, the writer, Kathleen Kennedy, the head of Lucasfilm, and Lord Miller all got together and they got on the same page. They had their script. They knew which what the Han Solo movie was that they wanted. From all reports we got, Lord Miller kind of hijacked the movie after that and started to make a film that was not the film that they had all agreed on. And they decided they wanted to make Han Solo a slapsticky comedy. Which I'm sure would have been interesting too, but it is not what Lucasfilm wanted. It's not what they agreed to. So finally, after being warned several times, Lucasfilm stepped in 80% of the way into filming and fired Lord Miller, brought in Ron Howard to try to salvage this thing. Ron Howard's one of the best. I mean, he has made some of the most iconic movies in film. He has some of my all time, my personal favorite Ron Howard movie is Backdraft. Oh my God. It's also my favorite Kurt Russell movie. Backdraft is so good. Check out Backdraft if you've not seen it. It's just, to me, it's my absolute favorite. I know a lot of people, a lot of other favorites from Ron Howard. Backdraft is mine. So anyway. So the question is, if it doesn't make a billion dollars, will this affect Ron Howard's legacy? Will Would Han Solo essentially be considered a flop if it doesn't make a billion dollars? Well, there's a couple of things to keep in mind here. First thing we need to keep in mind is, I don't think anybody was ever expecting Han Solo seriously to break a billion dollars. I, I mean, right? There's there's a lot of even core Star Wars fans that don't even think they should be making a Han Solo movie. A Han Solo solo movie may not have been the best idea. I'm a Star Wars fan. I'll I'll be there to see it. Absolutely, I'm very curious to see it. I'll be excited about anything for the first time that has the word Star Wars on it. But you know, even I'm not super psyched about it. I don't think it was a good decision to do a Han Solo movie. But, you know, we'll see how it works out. Number two is, I think there's a lot of people who, if, you know, Han Solo doesn't break a billion dollars, on top of the fact that not a ton of people are expecting it to break a billion dollars in the first place, a lot, most people understand Ron Howard has walked into an impossible situation. A movie that was already 80% shot, now he's got to come in, completely retool this movie, and still make the release date? Come on. Nobody in their right mind, if Han Solo doesn't work. And if Han Solo doesn't make a billion, and if Han Solo comes across as a little bit of a mess, I don't think anybody in their right mind are going to hold Ron Howard responsible for it. I mean, if he can pull off a miracle and make a great movie out of all the mess of the, you know, the, the transition and trying to retool all the movie, taking out some character, adding new characters, all this kind of stuff while still making the release date, Ron Howard will be viewed as a miracle worker. 
but should we expect that? I, I don't think so. The third thing is this. Look, no film has ever come out that you should consider if it doesn't make a billion dollars, it should be a flop. Like, let's take the one film in history that really should have made a billion dollars that didn't, which was Batman versus Superman. Like in the early days, I mentioned this on the podcast the other day, I thought Batman versus Superman had a chance to become the third film in history to hit $2 billion. I mean, it's Batman versus Superman. That's got a billion dollars written over it, but it didn't. It didn't. But it still made crap loads of money. It still made money. There's no way you should consider that movie a flop. Did it underperform? Sure, sure. You can say it underperformed, but no sane, rational person would look at the amount of money that Batman versus Superman made and call it a flop. There's no way. Now you can go, oh, but you make as much as it should have. Okay, yeah, that's true. And that's why it's fair to say maybe it underperformed a bit. But to call it a flop is just idiotic. I mean, it's just just call a movie that makes nine hundred million dollars. What was that? You know, I'm just going to take a second here. I'm going to pull up the actual number because I think it's high eight hundreds. Uh, Batman v Superman box office, and yeah, close to nine eight hundred and seventy two million dollars. So close to nine. Only a fool would look at a movie they made almost nine hundred million dollars and go, "Oh, that's a flop." Did it cost $800 million to make? No, then it ain't a flop. But it should have made more. Okay, maybe it should have made more, but then then say it underperformed a little put to call the flop is nonsense. Han Solo. I mean, look, everybody's calling Wonder Woman this big smash hit. And it's made, I think right now it's sitting like $814 million in that ballpark. And they're right. Wonder Woman is a big smash hit. And it's only made 800 something million dollars. Everybody's calling Spider-Man Homecoming this big smash hit. And it is. But it's only made 800 and like 30 million dollars. Uh, like one or two of the Lord of the Rings films. Not the Hobbit crap. I mean, the Lord of the Rings films made 800 something million dollars, 900 million dollars. Didn't crack a billion. Do we say, oh, that tarnished Peter Jackson's reputation and legacy? No, it didn't. It made huge money and everybody was happy. So if like Han Solo comes out and like makes... $810 million, considering all the drama it's gone through, considering the fact that it's a movie that even a lot of core Star Wars fans didn't think they should have made in the first place, and then understanding that it's got a director that came in at the last second to try to retool the entire movie and still make the release date, and it still makes $800 plus million, damn right you consider that a hit. That is a big hit. Doesn't matter how you cut it. And, and you know, I hear some Star Wars fans out there going, no, no, it's got the Star Wars name on it, so it should make a billion. That's nonsense. Just because you put Star Wars on it does not mean it's going to make a billion dollars. It doesn't. So, no, I, I I don't think if it doesn't make a billion dollars, I don't think it hurts Ron Howard's legacy in the slightest. If the movie's a total shit show and just sucks from beginning to end, well, yeah, and yeah you got to talk. But look, one bad film is not going to tarnish. Ron Howard has a couple of bad films. It's not like he's mistake free. He's made a couple bad films, but it doesn't take away the brilliant, iconic, some of the most memorable films in Hollywood history that he's also made. So no, I think Ron Howard is completely safe. The only way this whole Star Wars situation could have affected his legacy, I think, is if he was in Lord and Miller's position. If he was the original director, agreed to make a movie, hijacked the movie and started making his own movie that wasn't what they agreed to in the first place, and then they had to fire him, that might affect his legacy. But honestly, at this point, no, I, I don't I don't think I don't even think it's going to affect Lord Miller's legacy. Lord Miller, we're in that situation. We're all still me included. We're all still dying to see their next movie. So what happened with them on Han Solo does not take away what they did with 21 Jump Street, 22 Jump Street, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, you know, yada, yada, yada. They're great. And so, no, I don't think it's going to affect them at all. All right. Thanks a lot for the question. And we move on to the final topic of the day. And the final topic today comes to us from Joshua Langston, who writes, Hey, John, along with Avengers Infinity War, I think the 2018 film that we know very little about is Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. Why haven't we heard anything about it? When do you expect the first trailer to drop? I'm thinking with Star Wars in December, but what do I know? Would love to know what you think. All right. Thanks a lot for the question, uh, Joshua. And yeah, so we've got uh, Jurassic World coming out. And to the best of my knowledge, that movie's still like nine months away. I, let me just pull this up. 
uh, Jurassic World, uh, Fallen Kingdom release date. All right. Let me just pull that up there. I should know. Okay. So, uh, really? Yeah. June 22nd. Okay. So it was September, October, November, January, February, March, April, May, June. You were eight months. It's eight months away. Why haven't we heard anything about it? Because there's nothing to talk about. It's being shot. We already know the cast. We already know the director. We already know the script. We already know that they're shooting. Uh, what is there to know? To me, no news coming out of a production is the best news in the world. When everything's quiet, that means everything is humming along smoothly. So why haven't we heard anything about it? Because everything's going well. So we don't need to hear anything. We already know everything that we need to know about it. Well, when's the trailer coming? Well, the movie's still eight months away. You guys know me. I'm one of these guys that I think, and, and I think we're starting to see Hollywood fix this. I still think they put out first trailers for movies far too early. To me, you're just blowing your load. By putting out that early, because you put out a movie eight months, in, you put out a trailer eight months in advance, that does nothing for your film by the time it comes out. It's just too far removed. I just think it's too much too soon. So I don't expect to see the first Jurassic World movie, uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, until at least December. I know they may surprise us all, have it come out tomorrow. Absolutely, they might. I don't. Ex I wouldn't start expecting it though, and saying, "Okay, we should be getting it by now." I don't think we should expect it until around December, maybe even into January. Uh, they're going to do fine. They're going to do great on it. Now, as far as that other part uh, of your question, let me just bring that up here again for a second about it may be coming out with Star Wars in December. Well, here's the thing. I think we are now. It's safe to say this. We are at the point now with how YouTube works and all that kind of stuff to acknowledge studios no longer plan their trailer drops with a movie. Because even if like say Jurassic world had a trailer with star Wars episode eight, the reality is it's going to get released online a week before that or five days before it's going to hit online before it no longer do trailers premiere in front of movies. At least it's very rare. So what I, I no longer think it used to be that Hollywood marketing teams would say, okay, when do we want it? Which movie do we want to launch this trailer with? Yes, but that's no longer the case. Now I think it's just when on the calendar is best for us to release this trailer. And if it just so happens to be around when another movie's coming out, great, we'll attach it to that movie too, but that's not their first concern. They're not thinking, when does that movie come out? And that's when we'll launch our trailer. No. Now they just look at the calendar. They don't look at the release schedule. They just look at the calendar and say, when is a good time for us to release this trailer? That, okay, uh, we'll release it on that date. Now, what movies are opening around it? Okay, we'll attach it to that movie, attach it to that movie, attach it to that movie. I just don't think studios think in terms of releasing their trailers to coincide with a big movie that's already going to be out. I, I just don't think they look at it that way anymore. They release the trailer when they think it's a good time to release it. And they release it online first all the time. And then if it makes sense during its release of the trailer to attach it to a couple other movies that just came out, sure, great. But I just think we need to start thinking of it in different terms. All right, guys, that will do it for me for this Saturday installment of the John Campy Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, guys, since you're here, why don't you take a second, click on that subscribe button, become a subscriber to my John Campy YouTube channel. Also, make sure you follow me on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for me, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.